about 14 organizations along I-5 from Wellington down to Vancouver. Um, and we are impacted heavily with census issues, um, with so many other social issues as well. Um, so I'm, I'm here and we apologize. Uh, Velma was supposed to be here, but she had a last minute um, uh, board meeting event that she has to be at. So uh, we'll have a good conversation and I'll make sure she is in on the updates on that as well. And is it okay then? Hi, Patty. Hello. Right in time. I'm here. Yeah. Um, it's okay if we go around and uh, introduce ourselves and, and maybe what you're studying and you're thinking about studying in the future and why this is important for you. Start with either one, folks. Um, and thanks for having us here uh, from CERT to really discuss this issue. 
Um, so just a little background on the particular work. Um, it's, it's been an uphill battle for um, communities of color to organize to get state funding for this particular work that we're doing collectively. Um, so in about in a year ago, CERC helped with the help of Chair Kayak a consultant, helped to draft some legislation at the King County level to drop the um, complete count legislation through Rod Dabowski's office. And since then, um, Cherry's been working to build the Washington Census Alliance, which comprises of so many different nonprofits across the state of Washington that are uh, communities of color led, um, people of color led. And um, the initial ask from the state, I believe they were putting in half a million dollars for this work, but um, the Census Alliance really did an uphill battle to advocate for a full $15 million um, in the state legislature in 2019. Um, and then that's still not enough <laughs> because he, just to give you some context, in 2010, um, the census partnership specialists had about 225 people on their team. This year, they only have 22. Um, so there's a huge cut federally. Um, the current administration has been really cutting those resources going down to the community level. Um, you've also heard about the citizenship question and the whole battle. So right now, it is not going to be on the census. That's a good thing. But uh, also, the other flip side is that undocumented communities and communities of color still are you know, in fear of that particular rhetoric and that messaging. So it's still uh, a, a barrier for folks and a very confusing space to navigate around messaging. Uh, as you all know, that Washington State receives about $16 million. Um, is it 16, sorry, 16 billion each year, and that accounts about 2,000 per person each year that comes to the state here. It goes into various social services like um, low income um, housing uh, and energy assistance program, as well as like um, Section 8 housing, Medicaid, roads, and, and some other social services and education as well. Um, a lot of the time when we, we are talking to uh, folks who are um, English as a second language or English as a, you know, not their language of origin, they are um, they're receiving Medicaid benefits, they don't quite understand how this is tying to, to impact their lives and um, we usually say, you know, the state receives $7 billion towards Medicaid. If we don't get everyone counted, um, there will be cuts to their particular, you know, Medicaid program. And we know that there are issues already around um, those health care causes. And so CERC has been really um, looking at ways to get out the information in terms of the importance of completing the census, um, making sure that we work with our trusted messengers, our community liaisons, um, to work with their communities. There's uh, different approaches that folks have been working on. And a part of that is because census work is not uniform in terms of the messaging. There is the Washington Nonprofits who has their particular toolkits. Washington Census Alliance has their toolkit. The Census Bureau has their toolkit. And many other like nonprofits also created their own toolkits. What, what has been working for us is that being able to um, look at the, the toolkits that work best with our particular audiences and community members that we go to. Um, so that's kind of like a barrier in itself is the fact that there hasn't been enough resources to make sure there's a consolidated effort on messaging and, and a toolkit database. But we've been really um, reaching out to stakeholders and nonprofits that are leaders in their communities to bridge people together. So CERC works with a variety of nonprofits and Patty, you've been to our candidate forum a few times. On this particular work, we're, we're working with the region community, the Ethiopian community, um, WAMA, which is the Washington African Media Association, heavily led by Somali community members. Um, we're working with El Comite. Uh, they're the ones that helped to put on the May 1st march. We're working with the PACE, the Asian Pacific American Civic Engagement, the city of Renton, and the city of Tukwila. We've met, and in, in the context that we were able to really do this work and outreach in the grassroots level, um, a lot of the work that the census has been doing around outreach has been really organizing organizers, and um, we want to heavily invest in organizing grassroots in terms of not just the grass tops, but people are impacted daily. Um, 
So our particular strategy is making sure we're at ethnic grocery stores, we're building those partnerships right now, we're at link light rail stations, um, we're at religious spaces that community members convene at and congregate so that we can actually talk to community members and not just organize organizers. Um, and we are making sure that we, our folks that are being out there to do the outreach has the language capability to make sure there's no language accessibility issues. Um, we've, I just actually came back from a census meeting, and it's like a regional census meeting, but the, it's the Census Bureau uh, talking about data sets and, um, from, from their perspective, and they're hiring a lot of people right now. They're in the process of hiring about 1,000 people in our region here um, to be census workers for the next five to six months. Uh, it's it's going to be um, an interesting dynamic just because um, you know, we're also raising questions of cultural sensitivity, um, language accessibility as people go to door to door as well. Um, and then also some info on the census drop itself. People will be receiving uh, a postcard this year by mid-March to the end of March. Uh, the postcard will invite folks to go online to actually complete their census. One, one in four uh, families will receive an online invitation as well as a paper copy of the census, but the other three out of four will be only invited to the online. So, as you know, that can create barriers for digital, um, digital barriers for people who uh, don't have access to the internet and don't have the like navigation skills to be on the, the internet or web. Um, so, one of the things that are happening around the region and a lot of people are doing is working with libraries like yourselves and institutions and other public spaces so that community orgs can go in there and do like a whole weekend of helping to people for people to complete the census online. Um, so that's another strategy we're looking at on how we can be at four regions: um, Kent, Renton, White Center, and South Seattle. So we're working with those different regional partners. Like with Kent, we have the Kent Cultural Diversity Initiative Group that's led by Dinah Wilson in the city of Kent. Um, a lot of our community members are moving down further south, um, immigrant refugee communities, because they're pushed out, gentrification, displacement, and so forth, and transportation issues coming into the city. Um, White Center is another space where we're gonna be making sure that our folks are counted. Uh, Southeast Asian Americans, um, APIs live in the White Center, and the Latinx community. Um, knowing that also Mayor Jimmy Mata knows that this is really important from the city of Burien to make sure that folks are counted in the city of Burien, so we might be doing some partnership work with them. Um, and in short, it just really does connect to how resources are spent on residents that live in Washington State, um, making sure that you know there's going to be redistricting taking place. So by the end of December of 2020, um, Census Bureau should be sending over the data set to the president's office, and he should be signing off on that. And then by March of 2021, states would be receiving the data, and they would have to figure out how to, um, you know, implement like redistricting and so forth. And I believe with redistricting, they have two Republicans and, and two um, Democrats on that redistricting committee, and then they will be bringing on folks to, to help with that as well. And so in 2010, Washington State gained um, one congressional district because of the census. So it'll be interesting to see the impact of how many numbers of people are, are now um, in Washington State. Just answer the question. So does the redistricting um, uh, apply only to f federal um, uh, representation or uh, local representation? Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, I should be asking that question as well, so I'll make sure I jot that down and get back to you on that. Because I know it affects how many, for anybody who might not be familiar, redistricting means that they change, mm -hmm. you know, how big your district or how small it is and how many people you get to represent that district in the United States Congress, senators and Congress people. Um, but then we have mm -hmm. local governments too. Sure. Yeah. And there's a lot of transitions mm -hmm. on the local government as well. Um, census, in terms of like the census work we've done in the past, we've also had the census forum, which Patty, you and your partner was there for that particular forum. 
Um, we're making sure that we intersect that with other issues. Um, you know, issues like census and economic justice sometimes doesn't really get down to community level understanding. So what we're doing is making sure we bridge immigration, housing, um, economic justice, and census together. A similar strategy has been taken on the economic justice front when we're working for tax reform because Washington State has the most upside down tax code in the nation and most regressive tax code in the nation is that our communities of color have decided to center stories around um, undocumented stories from people on the ground level, also folks that are impacted by deportation and folks who are experiencing homelessness um, to start from there where the community is hurting before we say, hey, we need to change the tax code. Because that's a whole different language. So with the census, it's similar to that. It's like getting in touch with communities, talking to um, folks about what their communities' needs are, and then realizing that, hey, there is an impact on how census money will actually influence you know, what their community is going through. I think one of the, the biggest stumbling blocks right now is is the whole idea of who who completes the census, who fills it out, what, what people, and you know, not, not the people mm -hmm. helping. Um, because I, mean, I, until just a few months ago, I thought you had to be a citizen. Mm -hmm. And I think that, and, and, and of course I've found out since, that everybody, international students, everybody who's here, who's taking the spot here, fills out, should fill it out. Um, and, um, and of course, all of the talk about, um, you know, well, having a question about on the census about whether you're a citizen or not. I mean, I think that only, you know, it imploded it. Um, um, so it's unfortunate, I think, I and mean, we have a lot of educating to do yeah. to get everybody to fill it out. Yeah, they, yeah that's, that's really important. Thank you. So it's not just a good question, but is like, this sent, sent like on an address or to each individual? Because if it's like sent to an individual, then there's no point in counting that person, right? Because you already know that they're there. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. Is it sent? Is it sent to like a whole household, and then you have to write oh, how many people in this household? Because like individually, census mm -hmm. doesn't know like five people live there or like two people live there. Is this that how it's done? Yeah, it's by the household. I see. And then um, mm -hmm. there are certain numbers of people you can add on the paper portion, but on the online you can actually add a lot of folks um, on the household portion, like who lives in the household. There's ten questions on the census. I actually brought a sample copy of folks want to take a look at it. Um, so those those ten questions, that's the paper copy, but the online one, um, I don't think I really have some online one, but it's similar to that, but it'll expand on how many people you can have um, of folks that are living under your household. Nice. Yeah. And then, like, do you have to provide, like, name, ethnicity, all type of information for people that you are adding, you know? Yeah, like, ethnicity is going to be uh, an important portion of that, right? Because knowing the fact that, like, in from 2010, um, for example, the Cambodian American community, um, if we were to educate our community in 2010 and say, make sure you mark that you speak English and Khmer at home, then we would have at least 9,000 people in King County so that we can actually have voter registration materials that are translated into Khmer. Um, so like the, it's not translated into Korean uh, and Vietnamese, I believe, at the county level. Um, and that's because the Vietnamese community did a really large push to educate folks to make sure that they also state that you know they speak Vietnamese and English at home, even if you only just speak English at home, to make sure representation is there. Um, so those those questions that you see on there, I think those those are like finalized, I believe. Um, but I know that the online one, I don't think I have seen that yet either. But some questions, I guess, I wanted to learn from you all as well as like, what are like the different messaging that you've heard about census? In your community, and what what do you think is one of the major barriers um, for people accessing? So I'm just wondering um, for the recruitment because um, I'm gonna take well, I guess and say that whoever lives like um, in the ground place or however that you're more likely to open the door and ask uh, like that just because of how they look because it's. I mean, if they speak the language or a certain dialect, then you're likely to actually be like, oh, yes, I am this, this is how many people. So what I'm referring to is how has the recruitment been? Uh, would you know, like, from people who, for example, Asian community or 
um, anybody who's been from around the Mediterranean area, because I mean, if that would be the case, that they are more likely to uh, exchange communication with whoever they might have a similar experience than somebody who is just a traditional um, Caucasian person, I guess. Yeah, so your question is really asking how the recruitment process is for really people who represent community members. Right, because they, if they see, depending on who they see, they might be intimidated, so as a way, or have they been working on recruitment efforts that way so people are not intimidated? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. So I don't work for the Census Bureau. Okay. Uh, I, we, we're organizers that are on community level and we get grant money from oh. the state. Uh, the Census Bureau is a different agency um, so there's the Census Bureau, there's the Washington State Census Alliance, there's um, like for like the Green Northwest and Seattle Foundation who are funders to help fund the work and the money comes from the state legislature. Uh, right now the Seattle Foundation is fronting about I believe 2.5 million dollars for the Census Alliance to do the work so they get reimbursed through the state because the state is really difficult to go through the contracting process mm -hmm. with communities. Um, but we have been in touch with Census Bureau folks, and they do, um, you know, talk to us about the recruitment efforts. To be quite honest with you, our last meeting at the Seattle Census Task Force, um, there has been questions that you are raising up right now that has been raised there, um, just making sure that you know, people feel comfortable opening those doors. And from the tape of it, um, I think they are probably running into challenges of recruiting um, community folks to be a part of their recruitment process. And the recruitment process goes through like um, background checks and fingerprinting of, you know, very strenuous like ways to get people on board, which is also the reason why even though they're recruiting 1,000 people, they're not necessarily going to end up with 1,000 employees or uh, contractors, they're going to be much smaller, I would say 500 or maybe 400 people who would be passed on to that particular level of uh, contracting. Um, but you bring up a really good point and usually folks would be coming to other people's door when they didn't, they, they forgot to answer a question or right. they didn't like, you know, complete the census. So the follow-up will be happening in May, June, and July pretty much, and you'll be seeing people out there from the Census Bureau. Um, but your question speaks to a lot of the things that we've been feeling, is the confusion between the different people who are doing census work, right. and it's real, because some spots are like, wait, are you part of the Census Bureau, or how are you connected, how are you doing census work? Because right. um, there's so many different players in, in the arena right now, without no specific coordinated resources to make sure we have a leading like organization or leading um, agency to do that. Great question. Um, you know, I think it's you know at one point it's you know I just said that it might be really hard to count, you know, people who are houseless mm -hmm. right now. Um, is there any way to, you know, have them be a house Because mm -hmm. you know it feels like the funding you know is coming in big part you know should be going to them mm -hmm. but if they're not being counted you know then what does that mean and also like is there any protection you know to people who are filling out the census that our information will not be used by you know mm -hmm. ICE or like you know, any other you mm -hmm. know state you know hounding agency to be used against us tomorrow because you know we said that oh, we have like four people in the house but actually you know mm -hmm. do you know what I'm saying? Yeah sure thank you for those two questions um, the first one, we were told by the Recruitment um, Operations Office that they are looking to see how they can actually um, get folks who are experiencing homelessness to actually help support with the census so they can also be contracted um, to do that work and they would just have to use like a designated um, address which most people use down the downtown DSC or 99 Washington I believe. Um, so that, that is going on and um, in the details of how that recruitment process is working I don't know because that's an operation from Census Bureau. Your, sec your second question is really, really um, important because we know that Department of Licensing you know, has been giving information to ICE and sharing that information with ICE. Um, but with this particular work, to be quite honest with you, like even our folks that are doing this work, we still have that like caution in, you know, in our mind that are they sure they're not gonna send this information and share it with ICE because this administration is doing non-traditional 
you know, ways of damaging our communities. But in the Constitution and in law, they, they're not supposed to be sharing that at all. It's kept confidential. Thank you. Thank you. Seems like a letter to me. The whole constitutional, confidential. It's all I've that. But that's why, like, what Patty was saying is important to make sure we get folks to understand more about this info. And, and then the challenge is that the information changes sometimes too, not just not the facts, but like the way the information and messaging is going out to communities. Um, and I can only speak from CERC's uh, work with the Census. Um, and Census Bureau questions would require like having the Census Partnership Specialist or the Operations Manager to speak to you all. Um, operation managers probably focus more on recruiting. <laughs> but census uh, partner specialists like Francesca, uh, folks that have been doing this work for like probably two decades are more inclined with building partnerships and relationships. So speaking of you know, reaching out to people, I'm, I'm struck by um, how, how simple this is. I mean, there aren't many questions that they ask. Ten questions, yeah. That's it. And then all these pages are just other people in the family. So, yeah, hopefully people are willing I mean, to do it. The, the thing, too, is that, um, you know, it's going to be online, but it's in English and Spanish, like the main languages, and then they have the other breakdowns of, like, probably 12 other languages, but, like, how often do you see a census worker come with, like, all these different languages and then yeah. speak your language? That's, that's what I was thinking <laughs> when it comes to the recruitment, because it's like, if Somebody speaks like, for example, mm. what would it be, um, Somali? Mm. What one of the languages, and it's like, how, how do you know that they're doing the effort to recruit somebody? Because I mean, mm -hmm. there's a there's a community of uh, some Somali, mm -hmm. and it's like, well, you don't you don't want to say, oh yeah, I speak Somali, and yet you, you don't look the part, I guess mm -hmm. you could say. But at the same time, it's like you're trying to balance between reaching out to the people um, because it's part of your job, and also because sure. at the end of the day, they were all human, right? Yeah, you know, and then the constraints are on resources, right? Right. Like as a non grassroots nonprofit organization that's being sponsored, the most important thing for us also is to make sure that we don't go 55 miles per hour at a road that says 15 miles per hour. Yeah. Right, and then perpetuate this whole like. Like challenging aspect of like the system asking us to actually jump leaps and bounds when they're only pace walking themselves. So we don't want to perpetuate that as well. So with CERT, we're really adamant about um, making sure we have equitable contracting and equitable ways of doing this work, um, but also anchoring and understanding that our communities are suffering from the lack of resources and we need to organize with community folks. But then organizing in a way where we're like, wait a minute, we gotta go back to the institutions and say, hey, this is not working, you're gonna have to resource this out. And that's always been a challenge, but um, I find that that's, that's one way that we can do work within integrity. Like, not only are we just, we don't wanna like cut off our arms and legs to do this work, but we wanna also make sure we get our folks accounted for. So it's a very delicate balance. But other nonprofits might say otherwise, and that's, Partly because the nonprofit industrial complex. So I'm, I'm thinking back to the last time we did the census, and I was living in student housing, and I never got. Well, this is the first mm -hmm. time that they're doing it online. But I just, mm -hmm. and I never got anything. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe there was someone on like in the hallway table or something, but I didn't stop. And I and like I didn't get in like my student. Uh, mailbox and I didn't get uh -huh. so the first year they're doing email mm -hmm. um, or mm -hmm. online and so I'm just thinking about students who are such a vibrant part of our community mm -hmm. but so often I would suspect don't actually fill out the census yeah. and so I'm wondering if you if you happen to know like yeah. do the, the numbers of folks who, who are students filling those out like when we look at the numbers that we have from colleges, like, is there any kind of, mm -hmm. what's the word I'm looking for, right? Like, is there any kind of parity there? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, there are, we have like 4,000 FTE students here, right? Um, and so, how many of those would be filling out? Would be counted. Yeah, would be counted in the past. 
That's, um, that's also a really important question. And the census operations, uh, census partnership specialist folks, they have one person that's working on that right now, and like for folks who are living in closed quarters, yeah. or like, you know, senior homes and so forth, and student dorms. Um, and again, it speaks to the lack of resources because like I stated earlier, 225 partnerships and specialists in 2010, and now there's only 22. So you can imagine, like, Right, like University of Washington dorms, uh, you and other you know state colleges and universities, and they don't have the the manpower and human capital to do what they've done in 2010. And if you're telling us right now that 2010 you didn't receive anything, so they didn't even do that 100% in 2010 already. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, but what I can do is I can I can connect you all with the partnership specialist that is working on that, and maybe to follow up, ask a question because that is very important <coughs> for the student population you're working with. Do you know the percentage of people who responded to the 2010 census? Like you know, mm -hmm. like voting, like 33% of people who have or registered to vote mm -hmm. actually vote. But then do you know how many people actually respond to the census? I, I, I don't, but I think there is a way. <laughs> there, there is a way they collect that data, um, but I don't know that. But I just came from a training where we were being like taught how to access the data from data.census.gov. Mm -hmm. It's very complex. Yeah. Um, and they've made it easier. Like they changed the interface <laughs> to make it easier. <laughs> <laughs> But literally all the census partners were there, the regional government partners who were like getting trained on this, but it's like there's just a lot of like ways to dig into it. And I think they're phasing out American Fact Finder. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what yep. that is happening as well. Um, so there may be some follow-up things that can probably take place if you all are interested is to bring in the Census Bureau partnership specialist operations side or looking at accessing data and what that data can be, can be used to support the work that folks are doing. So I'm, I'm so stuck on the, the length of this. I just have to make one more comment. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I'm just, I think that when people are being encouraged to fill it out, mm -hmm. first of all, I don't see 10 questions. I see nine mm -hmm. for the first person, and I see seven for everybody else, and they're really short. When I hear a question, I think, oh, questions a lot. I think people have to be told that it's you know X number of very mm -hmm. short mm -hmm. questions. I mean, this could be filled out in three minutes max. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that the Renton, uh, city of Renton does is they have the cards, the marking card says 10, 10, 10, 10 questions, 10 minutes to every 10 years. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I like that. Um, yeah. I love it because Benito O'Born and Gina Hernandez um, is working on that. Gina Hernandez used to work for the Census Bureau, but now is working for the city of Renton because the city of Renton was undercounted in 2010, oh, right? Really? About 30,000 people didn't, didn't get counted um, in the city of Renton. That's a whole lot of money. If you're thinking about times 2,000 and how much you can go back to the community there. Regarding the portion um, from earlier, the only thing I can think of is that maybe if there was no um, receiving from the census about the paperwork, I'm guessing that maybe you were counted along with the family or um, the people that you work with? That, uh, I'm guessing because, I mean, if you're, you were a student, uh, mm -hmm. usually sure. students uh, attend, or at least um, typically would be fall, winter, spring, mm -hmm. or however it allows them to schedule. Yeah. So I'm guessing that maybe if it wasn't uh, delivered to your dorm or apartment at the time, however, was a condition, it may have been delivered over to Parents, guardians, however, that would have been a situation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your parents just, yeah. I, know, yeah. I, know, I, know, I mean, I've heard of it, but I don't remember ever being counted. I don't remember ever doing it. I feel like that also, like, my school, like, all the students and all the Yeah, right. Because like, I was in Madison, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and then I don't think, like, I even, like, heard of anybody filling out the census. Mm -hmm. So that really does speak to, like, bandwidth capacity, but they're not doing their job 100% to make sure people are counted. Um, yeah. And there's just, it was just about because it's like, um, 
for what, whether it be uh, colleges or assisted living. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's you usually go where the people where you think that you might interact with them and be like, oh, by the way, um, have you uh, committed this process? Uh, I guess because it's eventually going to be part of the digitized records. Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, yeah, the census has um, digitized their data stuff since uh, from 1790. You can actually access oh, it. Really? Yeah, <laughs> 1790. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Which is interesting I learned today, just before you. Hear. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, but then, like, how much time would you have to spend to go through all of that? Oh my but god. If you need it, it's there. Was that the first census? Um, I think so. Uh, 1790, maybe it's further back. Sorry, I don't know that info. Mm -hmm. um, Are you still getting organized before? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what um what type of like messaging and just like um have you seen a lot of census folks out here on the college to do um census information sessions or just passing out literature or flyers and all that? I think the only thing I've heard is from one of the librarians at North who's working for the census. Yeah. Okay. And so she's told us some things about it, but that's literally oh yeah. my God. That's, yeah. sorry, that's kinda of scary. Well right? so Lynn, the head library, yeah. did yeah. go to a training this summer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And wonderful human being. Um, and then um, we I've been working with some student leaders mm -hmm. who uh, are actually currently working on some programming uh -huh. around census. So then we've been working with Libby from from Washington um, bus mm -hmm. and I um, and I don't know if they're one of the designated partners. They are, yes. Yeah, that's what I thought yeah. because she it seems mm -hmm. like they she has a lot of information mm -hmm. and so yeah so we're working with the designated information person. <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking about what would make me fill this out. I mean, other than me knowing how important. Right, like mm -hmm. right. what would actually make me feel out? And so when what you said like that 10, 10, 10 yeah. would actually be like, okay, this is only gonna take 10 minutes yeah, of my time. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder how, I mean, I'm on social media a decent amount and I and I think that I follow people who are, you know, up to date on things, but I still haven't seen anything mm -hmm. like about the census on like social media and like getting it out that way, mm -hmm. which is how so many people get their information. Sure. Yeah. And so I wonder, and what strategies are uh, utilizing. Yeah. yeah, the Census Alliance um, have been working to put our stuff like on NPR, at KUOW. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> anyway, Q93 actually also had some uh, infomercial uh, spaces uh -huh. that they were talking about census as well, which I was, wow, okay. <laughs> good you. All right, that's right. good, that's a good one. Right. Um, but I do agree with you, like uh, there needs to be more robust like um, Ways to reach folks who are where, where their platforms are at, right? Mm -hmm. IG, yeah. uh, right now, what is TikTok? Oh, <laughs> TikTok. Yeah, TikTok. It <laughs> <laughs> could be a Facebook. Yeah, I'm just like shut up thinking about Facebook might put up the census form, um, you know? Oh, God, yeah. no. Well, considering that as a reputation, it's more than the use of this angel, but I mean, right. I think I'm, I'm guessing sorry, that I'm depending on really the last <laughs> like, that you would use. Social media, everybody is, and, but of course they, they might be thinking if they're on the news, like, but oh, wait a minute, how can I be for sure that my information, that my data is not going to be compromised? Yeah, I mean that's that's real, like the data compromisation, like uh, how much of our data has already been like mined and hacked into. I guess the other question I also want to pose to prepare as well and for the school is, you know, as because the Capitol Hill Lake, Lake Light Rail Station in this area is one of the areas that our, our program and partners are thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, so if we were to be out here, would folks be also available to be out there to help us to make sure that we talk to people who are, you know, passers by or walking through the Lake Light Rail Station and so forth? We are working as a team, so we'll probably have about 12 to 14 people together uh, to make sure that's out there. It's probably within like one or two hours. Wait, did I hear you just say that you're looking for vol other volunteers, like student if, if, volunteers? If students are interested in volunteering. I think you might want to contact um, uh, Nada Na Na Oakley. She's a, a, a faculty person and um, the Honor Society. She's the advisor for the Honor Society, PTK, Phi mm -hmm. Theta Kappa. And um, she just contacted me yesterday when I put out a an email about 
forming committee at 20, election 2020 committee. Mm -hmm. she, they're always looking for, for uh, volunteer projects and they'd be, you know, they're, they'd be good okay. in the first place and second place they need the volunteer. Maybe I can follow with you for the Okay, sure. Or, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I be, you know, like, you know, exactly what this goes to, but I think this also like sense is also like a tool of a process system, you know? Mm. Like for me to be able to get any help from you know the government I have to be counted. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm not counted, you know, then I might as well not exist, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, in the eyes of your own system. So have you heard like, you know, any arguments about why, you know, instead of like asking people to fill this out, like, you know, is there a better way to, you know, give um, mm -hmm. support, assistance, you know, and like redistricting or you know, whatever that comes out of the census, you know, mm -hmm. like in a different way other than just like telling people that, oh, if you do not put this out, you know, then yeah, I haven't heard anyone bring that up, so I'm going to note what you just asked there, and if it's okay for me to also share back with the CERT leadership. Mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, and I think it's important to bring those questions up because, like, you're right, are there alternative ways to gather data and information mm -hmm. without having this fear tactic of saying, you don't do this, you're not going to get this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Going back to your question about the messaging you're seeing in our neighborhoods, I live on Capitol Hill mm -hmm. and obviously work here too. Um, but I feel like all the advertising I've seen about the census is about getting a job to work mm -hmm. or oh, volunteer yeah. for the census. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'm like, but shouldn't there be as much effort into filling out the census and mm -hmm. promoting that? Yeah. So. Well, I think they're going to. It isn't April first the date that they're really going to start promoting it, and then you have to start. Yeah, it's really? <laughs> um, I thought, and then and then it really goes many months. Yeah, and then follow up as well, right? Uh, May, June, and July. But mid March is when folks will be receiving the okay. the online invitation um, card. But to your point, it's really interesting to look at yeah. that because. Right. From my knowledge, Capitol Hill is not a lot of communities of color, and mm -hmm. it's mainly white folks. But to have them just be recruited only for employment, for the messaging that like make sure you fill this out, right. speaks to like how our communities and regions are basically, you know. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, down south, we, we have nonprofits that are talking to people, so there's a message there. But census folks are still having a very hard time to make sure they recruit from our communities. Cause sure. It's just like your point. Yeah. But then again, like, yeah. The only thing I've seen about the census, it's because I read, like, I live in Shoreline, and I read the Shoreline City Council like, meeting minutes because what else was I doing? <laughs> and, and, and so they were talking about, like, the limited funding that, that had been allocated mm -hmm. and how they were, they were talking about whether or not they should allocate funding mm -hmm. to send out, um, mm -hmm. to send out, like, postcards or like information mm -hmm. so that people expect this and I think that part of their me their decision was like okay we can expect I think it was close to the number that you said on here like that each household is like forty eight hundred dollars in federal funds and like we if we spend ten thousand dollars sending out this information we only need like two households mm -hmm. we only need to get two extra households for us to like see that money back in federal funds mm -hmm. um, but it was really I mean they were still going back and forth they decided to do it but I would wonder, in addition to the community organ like the community organizations that are working, in addition to the um, like the state folks and the federal folks who are doing this, like, is there the potential for like um, like city councils and other like elected officials to allocate additional funding so that those numbers can get um, above what is like twenty two? It's um yeah so. Personally, I feel like the city council and the cities should allocate way more because they're getting a lot out of that. And the burden right now is really on like, you know, Washington Census Alliance folks to really reach out to their communities. Um, and I've been in situations where like, um, like a, a city from the east side comes into a review panel process and says, I need an organization funded in my city so I can tell my city council member. But I'm like, wait a minute. But if that's your prerogative and imperative, then 
why are you even at the table? Because the amount of money that's going to be dished out is still the same money that you're asking for. Just do it on your own. You're wasting time and carving space outside, you know, within the communities of color to benefit, you know, mainly majority white space. And so there, there are different like politics that happen um, within those areas too. But like just similar to City of Brentwood, when they're underfunded, like, they knew that they were underfunded in 2010. So now they're putting resources and hiring people. To, to help lead on that project, and I think they're doing some good work because they're they have they're able to fund about I think seventy like people as a part of their program. That's a lot, um, right? They're they're recruiting seventy people, I believe, to do work and outreach to communities in, in Renton, and they're also offering four hundred dollars for folks and organizations who want to create events in in, in Renton, so people can get four hundred dollars. Uh, for an organization to do like an outreach event at a cafe or something, or to, you know, incentivize people. For example, we can pay for people's coffee if we're going to do that at a coffee shop to make sure we talk to people. So, uh, I'm sorry that uh, Shoreline is late. Well, they did it. I mean, they're doing it. Yeah. yeah. It's mainly white, right? <laughs> you should run for council. Yeah. Oh, there you oh, go. Sure, <laughs> Oh, 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 yeah. I don't want to be anybody's boss, and I don't want to be anybody. No scrutiny. Yeah, no pressure, but representation matters. <laughs> it does. And you know what? I'll actually say that, like, for as white, short, for as white as Shoreline is, I've actually been like decently surprised at like the actual like, representation on the city council. Well, yeah. they actually have a large immigrant population up there now. A lot of the Eritreans, I think, or, or is it Somali? Well, or? yeah, like in, in North Seattle and starting to like, move in Shoreline. Yeah. I don't think they're actually in Shoreline. I mean, it's a pretty, there's only like 50,000 of us in Shoreline. Barricade lives up there. What? Barricade lives up there. Oh, he does? Yeah. And he's, uh, is he Somali or is he uh, Ethiopian? He's Ethiopian. Ethiopian. But from the Tigray community. Oh, yeah.
make like a two thousand dollar or whatever that number is like yeah. difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And I can also send over um, the city of Renton's ten 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 like yeah, parking yeah. Yeah. message. Um, it's online. They can probably drop some off for you here, but you can also print it from. But I would rather just have them drop it off because it's all. Um, I yeah, I want to share that with you because they did something. The students are doing something. Yeah. You want to send it even to the PIO, you know, and like the world can write like a new center story, you know, because that shows up everywhere on the website. Um, yeah. I like these ideas. They're already like, okay, how do we get, how do we get this message out? Yeah. And, 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 it's running paper? Paper? Yeah. and is yeah. is the collegian in hard copy anymore, or is it all online? Yeah, they it start. Is. They're going to make a. They're going to make hard copies again. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. They yeah they postponed it. But right now you do it online. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. So, some a couple of things to follow up on, and I'll send it over um, to either Kimberly or Patty. I don't mm -hmm. have your info. I'm sorry for that. Patty's. Well, we've been emailing. But I'll, Wait. I'll, oh. Okay. <laughs> sorry. All right. All right. So I can send it over to that particular thread, Yay. and then, um, and then if there is like another uh, maybe opportunity, if you want to have like part, census partners come and maybe meet with uh, a group here, um, a student group or. You know, faculty student group, then we can have a more robust way of like yeah. exchanging information. We're open to that as well. Yeah. It doesn't have to be in the context of cozy, but something mm -hmm. that can happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please thank let's you. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like a champion of civic engagement. Well, that's my job. <laughs> yeah. well, that's We're doing the passion. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much those are. I have lunch with Tina. Oh, oh yeah. I have a senior page. When did you have lunch with it recently? Oh, four hours ago. I have a private I don't know what she's doing these days. Oh, yeah. Well, hopefully, something will be out of this, whether it's a new show or broadcasting, publishing, or social media. It doesn't mean what things have been happening. Yeah. 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 Yeah.